It's always vaguely embarrassing to get these kinds of introductions. <laughs> but let me say that um, actually one of the reasons I'm here is a long association with a number of the faculty here, including Barbara, for sure. And, and it's no uh, small <laughs> connection to the persistence she showed actually to get us here, because uh, one of the embarrassing things is that my schedule is, is quite difficult these days. And, uh, very happy to be able to come and spend the day here at Rutgers. Uh, so my sequence from here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about this idea of essential computing, which is uh, what we put together as the overarching vision um, for our exploratory research at Intel. Um, and I'll explain uh, what we mean by that. When, when I give this talk, I often get the reaction, oh, I didn't know Intel cared about that kind of stuff. Or don't you guys just make microprocessors? Or, or very, very, very... Um, you know, they're, they're not incorrect impressions of the company, those are factual things, but they don't reflect the leadership mentality uh, and the broad responsibility that Intel feels for the computing industry as a whole. Um, and, uh, frankly, uh, the importance of a very, very broad range of activities going on in the computing community uh, for Intel's, you know, health and businesses and so on going forward. So it's all connected. Um, and uh, I think, you know, hopefully by the end of this you'll get a sense for the breadth of that vision. So I'm going to talk about Intel Research, which is the organization that I have primary ownership for and a range of external programs that touch on the academic community. I'm going to talk about this vision for essential computing. And while it's nice to have a really high-level, inspiring vision, you know, as, as researchers, you look at this and you say, okay, that sounds like what are we actually going to do about it? So we have a much more articulated structure of research themes and projects that will give you a much better sense for the specific things that we're working on. Uh, we'll talk about this idea of everyday sensing and perception, which is one of the, the key foci that we have uh, in this area of essential computing. Um, and hopefully we'll have a chance for some discussions and hopefully some questions. <coughs> I'd be happy to take some questions. Or I might have some questions for you. So. Um, so we tell people we do exploratory research, and they say, huh, what's that? What's that? Um, from an industrial point of view, uh, if you talk to our, 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 our partners in the business groups, they would look at us and they would say, well, you guys are doing academic type stuff, right? Um, but it's actually, that's not quite the right characterization. If, if you were, if the academic community were, were to look at what we're doing, they really you know, have to, in an articulated view, understand that we're doing explore, exploration, but with a particular focus, that is to drive the industry and to drive Intel's business, right, uh, in, in the longer run. So it's exploration, not in an undirected sense, but uh, it's not directed research in the possible sense. So what do we actually do? How do we actually turn that into reality? So our mission is to drive off-road map high-impact exploratory research vital to Intel. So it's got to be important for Intel. But we really are looking for the unexpected opportunities. We're looking for the new disruptive technologies. We're looking for things that represent a divergent direction. We spent the morning at the Wind Lab, right? I think that if you were to ask people 10 years ago, well, not 15 years ago, most of them would not have anticipated the breadth of impact that wireless has had on how we use computing on a day-to-day -day basis. But there are a few visionaries who would have said, yeah, this is going to happen, and then the other 80% of the people would have said, yeah, right, you know, or not really believe them. And it's been extraordinary, right? So that's an example of disruptive, of disruptive change, right? We're going through a whole bunch of other disruptive changes right now. So how do you operationalize that? Well, in order to do exploratory research, the first pillar, of course, has to be world-class technical expertise, so we absolutely hiring, we're hiring right now, the best researchers that we can find, and the most brilliant, uh, talented folks that we can find, and, and we're, we're proud of the fact that we think we compete, actually, uh, in a positive way, with the universities, for some of the best in the uh, Second, because we can only hire a small fraction, right, of the number of well-trained, growing people working in the state of the art today, we believe in broad collaboration. So we have an open collaborative structure around a lot of our research, we partner openly with the universities, um, in the intention of trying to get the broadest insight, the broadest leverage for the kinds of things that we're doing, um, and uh, really benefit from the innovation that's going on, not only just in the universities, but in other corporate labs. In addition, um, we have a deep belief in multidisciplinary research, right? Where the philosophy is that really, you know, in lots of areas of technology, we can drive basic technological capability very rapidly, but it's not necessarily that technology drive that enables breakthroughs right, in the application and use uh, in an ecosystem. We believe you have to bring together people, often from so social sciences, right, uh, maybe applications areas, if you're a computer scientist looking upward in the stack, as well as you know, what you might think of as core computer science or electrical engineering technologists, 
together in these multidisciplinary teams to actually frame the problems correctly and solve the most interesting problems. That's where really that <coughs> opportunities for disruption and large scale growth and so on come out. So really we, we, we are focused on driving the frontiers, right, of knowledge and understanding and technology with this, you know, radar app for, boy, what is the big opportunity in this? Is there a big opportunity? Um, as a part of Intel research, uh, we have a multi-tier structure for engaging the external community. Uh, Intel has, you know, had a systematic effort to engage the external community for several decades. Um, it begins with, at the highest level, the lab structure we have for Intel research. Um, those are labs that have a collection of uh, what we call blue badge Intel employee researchers associated with close, you know, closely with universities often they're co-located with. But there's only a small number of those because we can't afford to have, you know, hundreds of those sites. Um, at the next level, we have deep university relations with targeted schools and a whole range of uh, locations around the world. Um, and then beyond that, we have large uh, joint external research project programs run under something called the Research Council that I'm the chair of. Uh, and you know, I didn't draw the blue dots, or we didn't draw the blue dots for all those projects because they would have been sort of peppered all over the screen. There's literally hundreds, right? Maybe as many as a thousand such projects going on at any particular point in time. And many of the faculty in this room may actually be participants in those programs. Um, so we have this broad external engagement uh, activity uh, that's you know, a system, it's a set of processes that's been going on for years. Uh, I think it's worth highlighting something special that we've done, right, uh, in the last couple of weeks. We actually announced this, I guess it was over a month ago now, um, something called the Universal Parallel Computing Research Center. Sorry about the acronym. It was designed by a committee. Um, we have a research <coughs> partnership uh, that Intel and Microsoft have, has, have undertaken. And, and this is something that's unprecedented for us to do. Uh, and we decided to do it because we think there's a very, very important challenge in the industry right now. Um, about, uh, starting about three years ago, but the decisions that led to this change uh, go back at least four years before that, so about seven or eight years ago, um, the industry has turned and moved from a focus on frequency scaling to a focus on scaling performance through parallelism. So the hardware architectures and the trajectories of those platforms um, really have been set into the roadmaps and you know, everything Intel says, everything the other companies in the industry say reflects that that kind of basis is critical to where the whole industry is going. At the same time, the software industry has not, you know, sort of really adjusted and focused and shifted right onto that basis of scaling uh, based on parallelism. And frankly, it's not clear that we have all of the academic or intellectual uh, breakthroughs or, or technologies or perspectives that we need actually to put that industry safely onto that kind of basis of scaling. So Intel and Microsoft decided to lean forward um, and take an unusual role for us, right, uh, which is to try and lead uh, and encourage, right, the academic community to invest and focus on this space. Um, so think of it as the radical view of this is that maybe computer science needs to be rethought from the ground up on the basis of parallelism. That parallelism comes first, not second. Parallelism comes before sequence, right? And to, to point out that this is not completely crazy, if you were to go to the other engineering disciplines, right, if you were to go to electrical engineering, if you were to go to physics, if you were to go to biology, and tell them the world begins with sequence and then becomes parallel, they would say, no. <laughs> The world is this competing set of parallel processes going on all the time, right? Interacting with each other. So it's a pretty big change, right? And it's pretty important that we get the community focused on this. So we decided to go out and we actually ran a, a large scale, you know, competition, right, across a broad range of proposers, um, which wound up with uh, two centers being uh, funded, um, and they were just launched in the last month. That one's at Berkeley, led by Dave Patterson, um, and the other's at the University of Illinois, um, led by Mark Sneer and Gwen Mayhew. There we go. Um, and the basic idea here, right, is to work very closely between Intel and Microsoft, you know, researchers, and we're trying to get co-investment, right, from the government. Normally, the government investment would lead in this kind of an enterprise, right? It hasn't happened in this case. We're still hopeful that it will. Um, but we were able to get together you know, $20 million plus $15 million from the partners to put together a significant program. <coughs> and we're hoping that, of course, this won't be the only place that parallel computing research goes on, but there'll be, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, two pillars in the community, and that they will lead, you know, a much, much broader 
you know, sort of groundswell across the academic community for revitalization of research in these areas. Because we do believe that for whatever, you know, fundamental physical and uh, computer architecture kinds of reasons, that we're going to be on this Perelson track for the next decade or two. Okay. So the objective of these programs is really also sort of unprecedented <coughs> for, for what we've done. Very unusual for corporate you know, research arms to try and fund fundamental breakthroughs. Right. We tend to focus a little nearer in and mining some of the fundamental science that was done in the academic community. Here, the charter for this program is unusual. Our, 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 our charter and drive for these folks is to, is to create fundamental breakthroughs in parallel programming. Okay. Um, so I described this Intel Research Organization. It's got this exploratory charter. Um, it's, I think, useful to talk a little bit about how some of these things come to market, right? Because often there's this concern or question, how do you connect that kind of exploratory research to actual impact on what Intel is doing? So there's two examples that have happened recently that I would just hold up as, an, as interesting and perhaps surprising connections. Um, we had some work that went on uh, inside of Intel Research on something called the Remote Connectivity Platform. Um, this was innovation around, you know, really modification of low-level wireless infrastructure at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the Mac level. And by make, making some changes to the firmware, right, in existing, you know, sort of mainstream products, um, these researchers were able to extend uh, the uh, capabilities of, of Wi-Fi chips, right, in a point-to-point -point setting to build very, very long distance links, 384 kilometers. At one point it was a little record. It may have actually been surpassed by now. Um, but the main point of this was, by using these very, very low-cost chips in a slightly modified fashion, you could build low-cost point-to-point wireless links that were 2 to 20x cheaper than mainstream telecom systems, base station kind of systems. Um, and this actually complements the kinds of things that Intel is doing in other spaces, such as WiMAX, but really drives the penetration of computing into emerging regions, into less developed regions, perhaps even in, in places like the United States. Um, and that's, that's good for the whole society, but that's also good for the computing uh, industry because it increases access to that kind of computing resource, it increases economic development, it increases access to information, the internet, right, which really drives actually the use of all those things. So, so this was obviously, this was deployed uh, in uh, several test sites. Uh, this one was in India, several in Africa, proved the technology out, proved that it can operate in these kind of hostile environments. Um, and that uh, uh, remote connectivity platform is actually being moved into a product um, that will be put into the marketplace uh, and support the penetration of computing into these emerging regions. Now, the second thing that happened just this week, um, so it was on Tuesday, right? This is recent news. You can go and, and uh, search in Google News to get uh, information on this. Uh, is a piece of technology that also came out of Intel Research, uh, which is something called MashMaker. So, uh, the, whole, the ideas you know, behind the semantic web and tagging right, have been in the community for a number of years. Um, there's a whole range of companies that have sprung up building server-side mashups. Right? That is something that reaches out, aggregates, and, and remixes information from different internet sites and presents it to another server. Um, we got to thinking about this uh, and, and decided, boy, you know, that's great, but that's mashups for programmers. Right? And then the democratization of computing and the democratization of access to the control over information that's happening worldwide, wouldn't it be great if you could put that power into the hands of ordinary web servers, right? ordinary non-technical people? So the idea behind MashMaker right, is that you do client-side mashups. Right? And you do this by having a, a database right, of tools that people can use to skim content, capture content, build mashups, and share them right, in a community. Right? So you have people that can actually surf, and there's some sort of you know, WYSIWYG-like tools that allow you to drag and, and compose things together. So you could build your own personalized mashups right? uh, and, and, and actually share them with your friends right? uh, and create a large community of these kinds of things. It actually has some interesting implications if you want to think about it from a technical computer science view um, about, about uh, digital uh, rights to media. It has some implications there. and has some interesting implications for how you think about security architecture as well. But it's a very exciting, different view of how you do mashups. And Intel has taken the somewhat unusual step for us of actually creating a large-scale beta community, which means we're on track to potentially productizing this. Um, and this would be run as an internet service. So this is a really unique and interesting an example right, of a very different thing that Intel Research is creating inside of Intel as a corporation. 
And uh, you know, when we talk to folks inside the corporation about what the role of Intel research is, we get the very challenging position that our job is to transform Intel. And we're doing it. Okay, um, so let me talk about the central computing. So um, we sat down a couple of years ago and, and asked the big question. The big question is, what does the future of computing look like? Where is the edge changing most rapidly? And where do we want to focus our efforts and really drive our vision for how we, how we think about computing? Um, and we decided actually to focus on this notion of essential computing, which is the idea that historically computing has been very focused on analytical and productivity kinds of tasks. You know, make this faster, automate this, uh, do this deep numerical analysis, do this financial modeling, and so on. And that's really good stuff. Uh, but the big change that's happening is that computing is actually moving into right, core parts of our personal lives. Right? What we like to think of as the essential aspects of our lives. The things we care about, our relationships with our family, our relationships with our friends, our emotional sense of well-being, our sense of growth and expression, and so on. So this notion of essential computing is tied to this notion of applications and value that's around the essence of your life and a lot of computing in the essence of our lives. Right? So that's a really, you know, sort of a different view than building, you know, systems that can do better Monte Carlo analysis of the financial system. Well, that could actually eventually be turned into this, but that's not the primary focus, right? Um, but it turns out that if you think about how we use computers today, um, they're kind of crummy. Um, and if you think about seriously depending on computing technology for things in the essence of your life, you might have some reticence about doing that, right? So how do you actually make progress here? I mean, the last thing you want is you're in the middle of a high-tension emotional moment with your, your mother, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever. All of a sudden, you know, you get a blue screen. Not a good thing, right? Lots of stuff you can depend on. So you actually have to improve technology significantly in ways um, that are about making the technology more dependable. And that's not just the classical sort of fault-tolerant computing kind of stuff. It's a fundamental notion of robustness and dependability, right, that um, needs to be built in. You need to have predictability of the usage model and uh, uh, capabilities and so on. So there's two big, big, big pillars, right, that are the foundation of this notion of essential computing. So under this umbrella, we have this tagline that the objective for essential computing is to simplify and enrich all aspects of work and daily life. So capture the fact that there really are work aspects, you know, two essential aspects of computing, but the big focus really is on moving the stuff into daily life in ways that is, you know, way better than just getting me email 24 hours a day. Right? Something that really understands what's going on in my life and is able to help. Okay, so that's a nice high-level vision. How do you actually reduce that to some focus set of research activities? Um, in this vein of this multidisciplinary kind of focus, uh, we decided to build what we call research themes. And each of these research themes represents a direction of increasing capability in these computing systems. And we're you know, using the themes as a magnet to draw together researchers and projects to advance those capabilities. And of course, you know, these themes also form a magnet for collaboration, really, with the external community as well. So here's an example of a theme, uh, something we call personal awareness. So this is about building computing systems that are increasingly aware of personal aspects, inclinations, likes, dislikes, uh, uh, aspirations, uh, relationships, uh, values of their individual owner, right? their personal owner. Um, we have this phrase, empower me to achieve the goals that I value most. You might also think about having a system that understands you well enough that you would be comfortable with it representing you in some context, right? Whether it be negotiation, whether it be, you know, uh, calming down your, your, your ten-year-old daughter, I have a ten-year-old daughter, uh, talking to your you know, uh, grandmother who's very upset at the moment or what have you. That's a pretty ambitious goal, right? Computers can't do that today. Um, second thing is richly communicative. So personal is very individual-oriented. We decided we need to balance that with this notion of richly communicative. And the idea of richly communicative here is that while we use computers for communication pervasively, mostly the evolution of that technology has been about pushing bits. We've got high bandwidth networks, we've got wireless connectivity everywhere, we do email, we do instant messaging, we do, I don't know, probably, you guys probably do things I don't even know about, right? But most of that communication is about shoveling bits, it's not about enriching the communication. So if you think about it, computers now have access to all kinds of information about what's going on in, in the world around them, as well as all kinds of context, right? My laptop here 
has you know 20 gigabytes right of 20 years of email right that I've done and all kinds of information about relationships and context for things that are in flight and so on. Yet every time I send an email, it goes contextless right with no framing and no ability to have richer semantic meaning right. It all depends on external stuff. So you could think of versus the initiative as being about how do you actually elevate the capabilities of the communication system to make, take advantage of the fact that the world has increasingly got digital capture of all of this context and information, and do that not only in a bilateral fashion, but do it in a community-oriented fashion. Um, a third area um, is something we call physicality, um, and really comes out of a deep focus on, um, you know, the history of this in dental research was a focus on sensing and sensor networks, right? That's no secret, I think, to folks in this room. Uh, but here it's sort of taken a twist. So we're very much focused on user interfaces, um, haptics, uh, and then on the flip side of that, robotics. And I'll give some examples of that. But this is this, you know, I think, increasingly common notion that the physical world is being connected to the virtual world. Uh, and a particular set of themes, I'm thinking, we're pursuing around that. Um, there's two pillars of essential computing that I mentioned. The first was increasingly essential applications in our personal lives. Um, the second is technology that just works. So concealing complexity um, is very much about how you actually make the technology um, much more predictable, manageable, uh, and it's unpleasant. You know, my, my, grand, my mother shouldn't have to know what a web key is, right? I mean, that's just a bad thing, right? Um, none of us should have to know what a blue screen is, um, that kind of stuff, right? Okay. Um, now, uh, we also have a couple of new activities that have just gotten underway in the last year and really are very exciting. Um, the first is what we call data rich. And the idea here is really to bring the power of internet scale data, very, very large scale data, and all of the implicit information and semantics that are represented in that, because that could be large scale sensor data, that could be large scale internet and you know, online data. Um, there's many, many different sources of this, but the notion that Systems increasingly are not just about computation, they're about integrated access or data collections and the power and knowledge that come from that. Uh, and you know, the, the day isn't very far away that these kinds of devices will have half a terabyte on them, right? Um, and just think you know, what you could do if you had a half a terabyte of the world's knowledge, right, in these small mobile devices, right? Um, not just everything about you and your family and the people you care about, but something much deeper and broader. And I think that the, you know, the, the, the research community is just beginning to get its head around the fantastic opportunity that represents. Um, and then finally, we have a new research theme in the area of biosensors. Um, and you know, so there's been a huge revolution in the area of bioinformatics and the merging of information sciences with biology. Um, this is really a much more narrowly focused thing that you might imagine, right, would be where Intel might think about playing here. If you think about how you know, scaling down transistors to very, very small feature sizes and very, very sensitive, you know, uh, uh, capabilities, you begin to, to realize that you can actually begin to do molecular scale detection, right? You can actually begin to read out you know, very, very fine features of the behavior of biological systems, almost at molecular scale. That's how, how small and how, how sensitive these transistors are becoming. So this is really looking at can you couple together in a very tight way biological systems and do electrical sensing in these systems, whereas Frankly, it's been done uh, on a bunch of less, less robust, more difficult to use technologies up until date. And if you can do that, then obviously there's a huge, huge opportunity in coupling large-scale computing systems together with these biological systems. So those are the, the high-level themes. Let me drill down for a minute and talk about specific projects to make it a little tangible, uh, the kinds of things that we're doing. And it's, it's, it's the case that we have a lot of different things going on in Intel Research, and I couldn't possibly talk about all of them in such a short talk. But the idea is to select out a bunch of them and give you a little bit of a flavor you know, for the kind of stuff that's going on. Um, so one of the things we have in Intel research that might surprise you um, is that we have a group of social scientists, right, ethnographers, uh, and they've been a part of Intel research for over 10 years. So this is not a recent phenomenon. An example of the kinds of things they're doing um, is this project we have on personal digital money. So you guys all know about you know, electronic funds transfers and, you know, all the kinds of automation, right, of what banks do and what people maybe do in their personal finance balance or checkbooks or what have you. Personal digital money is about how you connect financial transactions with things that are personally meaningful for you. It turns out that for years and years there have been these custom currencies that have existed in, in the different social settings. Everything from premium stamps to there's something called Ithaca dollars, if there's anyone here from now. 
uh, to all kinds of you know, specialized forms of currency. Frequent flyer miles are an example of, concur of, of currency. Affinity cards, right, where you have an alumni card for Rutgers University, of course, here, um, that you use and you flash as a representation of who you are and your identity. Right? You spend through that card because you want to be identified with Rutgers University. So, so this project is really about when you actually move in this transition where you have electronic mediation of almost all of your financial activities, there's tremendous opportunities for meaning and affinity, right? The social science side of it that will drive how you do that. And companies like um, Bank One and you know, these guys down in North Carolina have made huge businesses off understanding that the social side of that is as important as the financial transaction efficiency side of that. So we have good work going on in a range of areas trying to understand, you know, it turns out in Islamic culture, there are some fundamentally different notions of money, kinds of money, right, and how that interacts with, with how you would treat it. Um, obviously, you know, there's a bunch of activity around uh, green, right, where people want, you know, for example, to know either the the carbon implications or the ecological implications of different mining decisions that they're making. Um, there's various kinds of online currencies that are emerging. Um, there's some really interesting ones in China, actually, the government's trying to control because they're really worried about. But, you know, I mean, there's Linden dollars and Second Life and other kinds of things going on where this crossover, right, is really quite interesting. Um, and then there's all kinds of loyalty programs and other kinds of things that you're aware of. So the, the interesting question here is can you actually view this as an integrated part of the design for commercial systems, for social systems, for community systems, right? Rather than just an automation opportunity, right? And, and, and begin to address this in some systematic way. And obviously one of the ways Intel would care about this is if there is such a possibility, you know, what's the moral equivalent of smart chips in your credit cards that you would want to build into all these digital platforms to support that kind of broad flexibility and proliferation of use? So this is in a personal awareness thing. Um, a second project is really in, in, in a more traditional kind of technical space, um, but this is personal awareness at the network usage level, right? So the previous project um, is about using machine learning technologies to look at actual machine behavior, host behavior in a network environment, and can you do uh, a personalized version, right, of filtering, thresholding, network behavior monitoring to more uh, rapidly and robustly detect things like um, viruses, worms, and what have you propagating through the network. Right? So large-scale commercial products that actually do this today, most of them work by using a fixed set of thresholds, especially in enterprises, you tend to set a fixed set of thresholds across all the machines uh, in, in the system. It doesn't work very well, because frankly, the way I use the network differs from the way a networking researcher in my group might use the network, differs from the way you know various other people, right? the different wireless environments that you're in, the different information that you're accessing. You know, boy, just amongst the people in this room, right, if you run various peer-to-peer -peer file sharing kinds of applications, your network behavior is radically different than people who don't do those kinds of things. So if you use a uniform set of thresholds, you get really, really you know, bad behavior, you get a lot of false positives, you get late detection, and so on. Um, and by using this diversity or customization approach, you can see this graph is, is intended to show that different um, DOS attacks, right, um, in terms of how big they are before they're actually detected, you can do a much, much better job, right? You do a much, much better job of detecting at lower rates uh, of, of propagation and earlier. So there's real opportunities to do this. Now there's some really interesting questions that still exist about how you do this in a manageable enterprise kind of setting because if you have different thresholds everywhere, right, it's a bit problematic to understand what's going on. So there's still a lot more work to be done, but it represents the promise, right, of personalization or customization around individual behavior um, that, that, that could bring value. In the richly communicative theme, um, we have a project called Common Sense, right? and it's a pun, of course, right? Um, but it's common in the sense of it's actually a community activity, and it's, you know, sense, both, both, on, both obvious meanings of sense. But the idea here is that we're building an environmental sensing platform that allows people to engage, right, as a community in proactive environmental sensing. So why might you want to do that? Well, so for example, this is uh, carbon monoxide data from Accra, Ghana, that was collected by people carrying backpacks, right, with carbon monoxide sensors. Turns out that localized carbon monoxide pollution in that area is a big problem. And because the government, right, doesn't have the capability to measure and monitor in this kind of fine scale, it's not a criticism of their government. Our government doesn't have it either. It's a cost issue, right? Um, 
it's very hard to do anything about it. So um, we built a system that actually allows people to walk around, and you can see that the sensing trails actually represent you know, paths along the roads and the other things that they traverse. Um, so you get this kind of partial uh, visibility into what's going on. You could imagine taking that data and synthesizing a scientific perspective and then making a case for some regulatory change or for some particular enforcement change around local points of pollution. We're not just doing that abroad. Um, there's an effort underway in San Francisco right now to put these sensing devices up on these street sweepers, like up on top of the, the truck uh, that drives around San Francisco and covers the area <coughs> much more systematically. Um, and you can imagine, again, being able to collect the data to make a case for regulatory change or societal change. So this is really interesting, um, but it's a little bit dangerous, right? Because if you let just anyone take any kind of sensor data and make a case on it, we know that you can get into a lot of shoddy science, right? You get a lot of populism that has re no real sound scientific basis, uh, and that creates all kinds of problems. So, you know, we're trying to develop not only an infrastructure of devices, uh, but also some communities and some understanding, right, from a technical point of view, what's appropriate, what's responsible, what kinds of conclusions should you be able to draw, what kinds of conclusions you really ought not to be speaking to, uh, and do this responsibly. Uh, in the physicality space, um, we have a project called Personal Robotics. Really kind of interesting what's happened to robotics, right? Robotics is simultaneously a huge success and invisible. Right? It's a huge success in that if you go into industrial manufacturing, robots are everywhere. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of them, millions of them doing everything imaginable. Right? Um, but they, to a large degree, don't exist in any kind of consumer setting. Right? And the fundamental reason for that um, is that um, their behavior is not robust in the presence of uncertainty. Right? You go to the industrial environment, they have controlled lighting, they have controlled placement of objects, objects come in pallets with particular orientations. And they're program very finely to grab them in a particular configuration and manipulate them in certain structured ways. Um, if you bring them into your bedroom, you know, if it's like my bedroom, you have socks on the floor, you have the kids move the things around, uh, and so on. And, and robots tend to not be robust in that kind of uncertain environment. So um, on the premise that this might be a really big and interesting opportunity for computing going forward, uh, we have a project that's looking at new sensing technologies. Uh, learning and planning technologies in small closed loops, right, to increase robustness of behavior um, around this. And to give you a little bit of an idea of what you'd like to have the ambition of, you know, a robot that can do some pretty basic, simple tasks. You know, get me that soda. I used to say a beer, but this is, you know, a little more politically correct. Um, get me that medication. Get me my eyeglasses. This is an example of something that's hard to pick up and manipulate safely, uh, and so on. Um, so many interesting things that we're doing. Uh, we have a project in electric field sensing, pre-touch. Uh, and the idea here is to use, uh, in some sense, the fringing fields right around some electrical sensors. This is how sharks actually can tell where you are before they bite you. Right? They actually don't see you. Actually, they use the electrical field uh, around them to sense how close you are, whether you're alive or not. They don't tend to bite dead things, right? Um, and actually, you know, uh, I'll bite you. And um, what they do is, um, what we're doing is we're putting sensors on the fingers of the robot. And you can actually, we have a demo where you can actually bring the robot arm out, and it can feel that the cam's there without touching it. So that's really interesting, because a big problem is if you don't have perfect alignment, if you don't have perfect vision systems, you bring the robotic arm out, you knock the thing over, game over, right? You screwed up the whole thing. So these kinds of pre-touch kinds of technologies have the promise of, of allowing you to do you know, much more robust kind of manipulation. Um, obviously, in order to do it, if you're going to have vision as any part of it, you have to have large-scale object recognition systems. That's another area of research. Um, Intel researchers built a big segment of the planning software for the, the, the robot or automobile that won the DARPA Grand Challenge uh, in 2000. Or 2000 yeah, I think it was 2007, actually, um, at CMU. Uh, and uh, uh, we actually have a project to build a robotic barkeep. Um, you might say, why would you build a barkeep? Well, it turns out that most of the work on navigation and localization for robots um, has been done in the context of automobiles, right? So, you know, it has this notion, you have good mapping data, you have points of reference, you have GPS, and you're operating in a space where tens of feet is really the metric, right? Um, the idea of a robotic barkeep is that you really want this robot to operate in your home, in social settings, right, in groups of large people, or large groups of people. So, so how do you actually do that? If you're in a room like this, right, how do you orient yourself how do you avoid human obstacles that are moving around all the time and so on? So it really is trying to get this question of you can manipulate human objects, right, which you know, 
a mug with a little finger handle, right? You know, Bob is very much a human object, um, and operate in that kind of human setting, human social setting. Um, in the physicality space, there is, again, this notion of deep connection of the cyber and the physical world. Uh, one of the areas here working in on is wireless power. Right, so we now live in a world in which if you cut the cord for wireless communication, right, so you don't have wires for your communication anymore, the only cord left is the power cord. So wouldn't it be nice if you could cut that last power cord? Right? So um, the hypothesis here is that wireless power at many scales might be a compelling thing, an interesting thing for, for Intel to be um, uh, able to deliver. And we're looking at this at two levels. So one is uh, low power, really, really, you know, low power devices. And here we've been building what's technically passive RFID tags, right? But that have active computing devices in them for a number of years under a project called WISP. Um, but we've also been begun looking at larger scale systems. And here's a picture of a large scale system, right? Sort of large scale E and M, right? Looking at uh, some ideas that go all the way back to Tesla, right? About how could you actually, you know, have a mobile internet device, a small mobile system, and actually transfer, transfer power to it wirelessly, right, from some other devices in the room, and do so without irradiating, right, to an extreme degree, the people in the room, and of course doing it in an energy efficient fashion. So there's some interesting opportunities there. There's a lot of big, big challenges there. Um, but the idea is looking at uh, both near field UHF kind of coupling um, and high power resonant coupling across, across significant distances. Very exciting if we can make any headway there. Um, as I mentioned before, programming and parallel uh, programming, of course, are, are very important things uh, uh, for the whole industry and, of course, Intel. Uh, one of the efforts we have in this space is something called Ivy, which I think is a well-known project in the, the programming languages community. Uh, and, and here it really is trying to see if we can bridge the gap between low-level systems-oriented programming languages that have fairly nasty semantics at the lowest level, um, to make it much easier to build correct concurrent programs in these kinds of frameworks. Um, and we've been working on a range of classical problems, such as you know, how you actually ensure safe use of pointers, memory management safety, and so on. But the type system is well with, with some dynamic checking. Um, and um, and they had some pretty significant successes in terms of being able to capture um, you know, sort of a whole bootable Linux kernel in this kind of a programming language with most of those safety properties. I think, you know, frankly, we, we succeeded in building this bootable Linux kernel in Ivy. Um, I think there were only two places, right, where really we had to violate you know, the, the type system. Uh, more recently, in this concurrent programming vein, we've been working on a sharing checker for C um, that actually allows us to um, declare semantics for the sharing patterns around data structures. Uh, and the compiler and the runtime are checking and supporting that uh, uh, set of semantics and really flagging uh, differences, right? So it's an attempt to move up from the low-level memory race kind of model of the kinds of tools you could provide to something that's integrated with the abstractions that the programmers are thinking about. Um, we have to do some work in architecture. This is Intel, after all. So here's an interesting project we have going on at Intel Research that's asking the question, boy, you're going to get all these cores. Can you do something besides just make the programs run faster? So the idea behind uh, the log-based architecture project and this concealing complexity theme is to ask the question, can we do something online in terms of monitoring the behavior of the program and checking um, the execution of the program to not make it go faster, but maybe make it run better, right? To do something that makes it safer, to do something that makes its execution more robust, to do something that detects intrusions, to do something that just detects malfunctions or what have you. So the idea here is really kind of simple. The idea here is, you take one of these cores and you use it to run what you might think of as the primary application. Or if you really want to make us happy, you take 16 of these cores and use it to run the primary application. But at the same time, right, you dedicate another computing infrastructure, which might be just a core of similar fashion, to actually monitor what's going on. Right? So we do this at the software level already with certain kinds of demons and monitors. But this is talking about doing it at a very fine-grained level all the way down to hardware. So you, think, you might think of it as uh, the application running on one core generates a log, which represents sort of the full e evolution of the execution state for that core. And that gets transported, right, through the memory structures on the chip to another core. Um, and that core actually is running some kind of debugging, monitoring, checking tools in real time, right, to actually make sure that things haven't gone awry. 
and you can imagine there's a whole range of things that you could could could, could do. Um, we call these things lifeguards, but you know you can do various kinds of race checking, you can do various kinds of enduring checking, you can do various kinds of security checking, taint checking is a big area, and so on. Big challenges. How could you actually do this at real speed and at reasonable cost, right? So the research here has been really to look at, if you look at this, how much state do you actually have to move across this boundary? Um, can you build special structures, right? Hopefully small, hopefully inexpensive, right, on the capture side and on the analysis side to allow you to build these things that actually run in real time. And if you look at classical various kinds of software tools, very often they will force you at uh, development time to run programs at one-tenth real-time speed or even a hundredth in some cases, depending on the properties you're monitoring. If you want to do this in real time, you know, you have to add some work to do that. Um, but a lot of the research has been how do you actually squeeze that down to being something very minimal so you actually could get into a chip design. Um, and there's some real insight, I think, in the kinds of very flexible kinds of state manipulation structures you'd like to add, right, to these programs and actually to do this, to add to these architectures and, act, and to, to actually be able to do this kind of monitoring. It actually also turns out, one of the things that came out in an interesting recent, recent discussion is that some of this work may also be useful for processor validation which is a big challenge, right, in the mainstream execution of processor designs. But this is a really interesting area, and I would certainly encourage folks to think about if you can make a case for significant value in, in monitoring state for development or even for online continuous monitoring, say, in a server complex, that there may be the opportunity, actually, to build hardware infrastructure that supports that. So we as a community need to make a case for value around properties beyond just performance. Um, in the data-rich computing uh, uh, theme, we have a project called Neighborhood Aware Networking. It's kind of an interesting project, um, and it's just, just really gotten started. Um, and the premise is old, right, but the opportunities really seem to be significant and new. And, um, the, uh, the premise is, you know, you really ought to share the resources that you have at the edge, right, because you have limited amount of, of uh, uplink bandwidth, right, typically it's uplink bandwidth, but you also have a limited amount of downlink bandwidth. Because of the relatively slow way that the wired infrastructure has been evolving in most residential areas, um, that the local wireless links that you may be able to get access to that bridge these different access points, that bridge these different uplinks, may actually be fast enough right, that you can begin to do efficient coordination and sharing. Um, so this is an effort that's really looking at a broad range of coordination um, at multiple layers, at the application layer, at the IP layer, and then ultimately at the Mac and the radio layer uh, to actually try and achieve much more efficient use of the available resources. Um, it's tied to data rich because the big motivation for this is when you move big data objects around. Right? So thinking about it as an application or as a problem, if I want to move multi-gigabyte objects around all the time, right? can I do something much more clever with the uh, neighborhood networking resources that I have? Obviously, the most powerful maybe in an apartment building kind of setting, but even quite powerful in a, you know, single family home kind of setting where the spacing is something like 100 feet or something like that. Some really promising results in that space. Um, in the biosensors uh, thing, um, I spoke to this a little bit earlier. Um, really the opportunity is around beginning to build right, um, electronic scale devices that begin to be comparable in size to the molecular kinds of structures that you'd like to actually sense and understand. Um, Obviously, one of the things that we can do with large-scale integration capability in the electronics industry is build large arrays of these things and do very, very high-throughput-oriented kind of analysis of what's going on if we can do this kind of electrical sensing robustly. Um, so the vision here, right, is can you build um, sensor arrays and associated surface chemistry, right, and, and, and sensing techniques so that you can make use of that mass metabolism to more efficiently do large-scale bi biological analysis problems. Um, the current focus of this project is on DNA sequencing. That's a well-formulated um, challenge. It's a well-understood you know, set of existing technologies. They're actually evolving pretty rapidly, right? Um, and the, the basic difference here is that almost all of the existing technologies um, are based on optical uh, sensing and fluorescent labeling, which means you have to do amplification. You have to actually take the DNA molecules and create many, many instances of them. You have to label them sort of in the same fashion. And then you read out using optical techniques, actually, you know, how it was labeled, right? whether it was labeled or not. Um, if you can eliminate that step, right, this polymerase chain reaction step that's required to do the amplification, you potentially, right, can do this much less sample. You can do it a lot quicker. Uh, you can do it at lower cost. 
Um, we're a long ways from being there, right? This is advanced research kind of activity, uh, but it gives you an idea for, for the opportunity. So you can imagine actually that you would have uh, various kinds of DNA reactions going on, right, in a single uh, sensing cell, right, that would allow you to read out successive elements of the DNA sequence, and then you would assemble using shotgun techniques or the like. Um, just to show that we do things outside the themes, um, we have uh, a category called potpourri, right? Which is delightful stuff that's colorful and wonderful and, and so on, but doesn't necessarily fit into the, the themed activities. Um, this is actually something that emerged as a surprise. So we, we developed something called the Technology Metabolism Index. Well, what is that? It turns out that for a long time, people have believed um, that adoption of ICT, right, information and computing technologies, um, was correlated primarily with, uh, I think it was called the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of wealth, right? So, people did a lot of study and they said, you know, it just correlates with wealth, right? So we have a bunch of ethnographers who believe culture is very important, so they said, that's just not right. That doesn't match our experience, right? So like good researchers, when they realized there was a gap between prevailing wisdom and what they were seeing, right, in the field, um, they decided to go out and do a study. And they did a deep study um, of you know, all of these different countries. Um, and they developed a framework that actually assesses cultural variables that they believe are more highly correlated with adoption of technology. Now, I'm not going to stand here and try to explain what these technical terms are, right? The cultural identity, normative ethos, network density, active and agile state, and so on. But they're characterizations of cultural properties of society that turn out, in combination, to actually have a very, very big effect on how rapidly societies adopt technology. Um, and um, this is really interesting, obviously, to anyone in the technology uh, production business, because you want to target the places, right, that are going to adopt technology fast and be first adopters. But frankly, it's also of tremendous interest to governments that are trying to get their societies to adopt technology and modernize and understand why it is that, that they don't. And it's obviously very interesting to companies that are trying to transform society so they're more rapid adopters of technology. So um, what's shown over here, actually, um, the, 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 just, uh, I'll just give it the highest level, the, the orange, well, it's kind of maroon color, right, are the countries that actually have the set of properties that lead them to be rapid technology adopters. And you can see, then you've got Finland up there, you've got Korea up there, but there's some oddities. There's got Mongolia, right, and other kinds of, of countries that actually turn out to be rapid technology adopters. Uh, that you wouldn't have guessed on the basis of either, you know, sort of a superficial analysis of the culture or their, or their wealth. So, you know, learning how to influence the ecosystem so they develop and they accelerate and their ability to adopt this technology faster. Um, and, you know, really um, help us to uh, identify places, right, where it might, a, a country or a region or a, a ethnic group might be uh, a rapid adopter, but we just haven't found them yet. Right? This is a somewhat uh, there's been a pretty su somewhat non-systematic kind of search going on about to do this. So it's really quite interesting. And that actually has begun to influence some of the thinking in the corporation for how we uh, approach emerging markets. Okay, so let me say a few words about this everyday sensing and perception. Um, this is uh, something we call a mega bad inside of our organization. That doesn't necessarily mean anything to you guys, but it really is a very focused, large-scale research effort. Um, in in uh, uh, Intel research. Now, just to calibrate you, Intel is a gigantic company. When I say large-scale research effort, that means we have 12 people working on it. Okay. So don't underestimate what you can do, right, with small teams of really brilliant people. But that's a gigantic investment for us at the Exploratory Research Stage. Okay, so you guys have probably all heard uh, of Mark Weiser, right? He had this wonderful vision of ubiquitous computing articulated when he was at, uh, at Park. Uh, and, and he really said, you know, that uh, it's all about making technology so deeply integrated into our lives and society that we don't think about them as technologies. They're not externalities, right? They're integrated parts of how we act and how we live and so on. Um, and so here we are, you know, almost 20 years since the time Mark said this, and we're not there. We're not there. And it's not because we don't have enough computing. You know, we have gigaops of performance, right? It's not because we don't have enough storage. These little devices have gigantic amounts of storage. And it's probably not because we don't have enough networking bandwidth. It's because, you know, as slow as 3D networks are, right, they are still dramatically faster than what was really, you know, broadly available at that time. They're as fast as wired networking was in that day. Right? 
right here. So the theory here, or the, the, the question here is, are we at an inflection point where inference and sensing are really the fundamental transformers around finally building you know, invisible, ubiquitous, intuitive technology that's much more robust in everyday life? So that's, that's the thesis behind uh, the effort in everyday sensing and perception and in Delta research. So what is this effort? Um, we launched this effort uh, early this year. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and the basic idea here is the observation that people have been building um, demo studs, right? Um, things that focus on a particular application domain that use sensing and they use machine learning technology, inference, right, uh, to, to do something wonderful in a particular domain. Uh, but typically, um, they don't reflect a robust or general enough technology, right, that you could actually imagine using it across a broad range of applications. Sometimes they're very sensitive to the individuals involved, they have to be trained in the individuals involved. Sometimes they're very sensitive to the specific sensors and the sensor deployments involved. Um, sometimes they're very specific to the application domain. Right? If you're building classifiers and you're trying to classify against a fixed set of activities, if I change that set of activities subtly, it may completely throw off these systems. So you go talk to this community and they say, oh, I can do a demonstration at 80% accuracy. You perturb the system by 5% and their system goes to 5% accuracy. Or various you know, analogs of that. So um, our view is that there's this gap between all the promise that's been demonstrated and the ability to drive this into broad scale, you know, robust use to get it to a level in which um, instead of having to have a PhD in machine learning, a PhD in sensing, a PhD in user interfaces to build these applications, you could actually have an API and use sensing and perception as a service to build applications without understanding anything about the sensing and perception that's going on. Because that's what you really need to unlock and really unleash a, a, a broad range of innovation. So really, the focus of everyday sensing and perception, this effort is to drive fundamental research advances to enable computing systems to become aware of everyday activities and environments. Um, and we have a goal, right, which is an attempt to capture what I just described as this kind of robustness and flexibility, which is 90% accuracy for 90% of your day. 90% right? accuracy because there's the belief that if you can get to that kind of a level, that's good enough to do lots of useful things. 90% of the day means you don't get outs on coverage, right? It's got to capture, in some sense, the majority of your existence, right? The majority of your experience, right? In order to begin to become useful in a very, very broad way. So, so that reflects the need for accuracy, for coverage, variety of environments. And of course, you need energy efficiency. And of course, you need privacy preserving if this is going to be broadly used and deployed in any way. This is by no means, you know, an Intel research only activity. Um, and um, even within Intel research, right, this includes a broad range of expertises. We have experts in machine learning, imaging, vision, sensing, data intensive uh, analysis, human computer interfaces, and all kinds of novel apps. Uh, but we also um, are engaging and working with uh, a broad range of external partners. Uh, we're actually running a program right now called the uh, MSP Challenge, uh, which we've seeded a bunch of research projects in the universities with our multi-sensor platform infrastructure, uh, with the challenge of building interesting applications and you know, robust uh, interim systems on top of that. Um, we're working with partners and other research laboratories. We really would like to see this whole field move forward in a fundamental way so that these technologies can find broad and large scale use in a broad range of things that you and I could buy every day. Well, maybe not buy every day, maybe use every day. So ESP, right, this, this, this activity is about making computing systems aware of their users in context and everyday activities and environments. That's the, one of our big focus folk, folk on Okay. And just to sort of dial up the contrast on this, uh, we spent a bunch of time thinking about how can we actually explain to folks uh, what is some of the unrealized opportunity and where computing systems are actually going over the next 10 years. So one of the things that, one of the ways that, to think about this is what are things that people do every day that it's so clear that computers can't do today, that you could imagine that there's a big opportunity and a big gap there that could be bridged by the advance of technology. Because it's very easy, because computers are so capable in many ways to begin to think, oh, they've already done it all, right? And we know they have. So here's an example. Here's a group of people socializing, playing together, right? Learning all kinds of things about them, laughing, enjoying each other, building human bonds, right? Computers are basically useless in that kind of a setting. Well, I'm being 
a, a little bit over the top here. They're not very useful in those kinds of settings. We don't normally think about them in augmenting those kinds of settings. So we have this notion of, of laugh, right? The other place of computers, even though they've been present for a long period of time, um, they really haven't really sort of truly introduced themselves in a powerful way is in learning, right? So we have computing tools, right? Computer-based education goes back at least 50 years, right? But it's mostly about repetition and automation. It's not about the deeper thing of understanding where the learner is, speaking them in, in, to them in a way that they can actually understand, tessellating this gap between what they know and what they don't know, what they understand what they don't understand, emotionally supporting them and encouraging them that we know these are the things the teaching is really about in addition to the transfer of knowledge. And computers are not very good in helping with any of those things now, and they could be. Right. Um, you know, moving to, to more more uh, uh, sort of physical things. I mean, if you look at computers and what human beings do every day, human beings touch and manipulate the physical world every day, right? And we talked about robotics a little bit. Computing systems are really not very good at doing that, and it's different from you know control systems where you're talking about you know controlling the physical world from an actuation point of view. This is direct physical manipulation which is a huge obstacle to all kinds of tasks, from healthcare to, to personal robotics or what have you. Uh, and then finally, one thing that we do every day, which is very, very powerful, is that we move and navigate in a seamless fashion. And that's the root of a lot of flexibility of our interaction, uh, social structure and, and, and capability. And computing systems are pretty limited in that regard as well. But since they're pervasive and small and mobile, boy, maybe they could do some of those things. So there's a whole range of things. And I'm sure this is just as thin a slice of this. Uh, there's a huge gap and opportunity for computing systems to be at a dramatically different level. Okay, I think I'm going to run out of time here. Oh, I'm already out of time. Oh, let me spend about five minutes finishing up. Okay, so we have this everyday sensing and perception project. Um, it's hard from a uh, conceptual point of view and a capabilities point of view. It's also hard from a systems engineering point of view. Here's an example. You had a whole range of these intelligent devices, intelligent intuitive devices, um, and you imagine populating them with sensors of various types. Um, if you add up just the sensors we have here, right, not allowing for all the new ones that people are inventing and all the wonderful things, um, all of those sensors together um, in this picture are about three watts continuous, right? So, you know, if you take a, a, a phone with a reasonable size battery, um, you could run your sensors for about one and a half hours and your battery would be that's not too great. You generally expect to not have to run back to the charger every hour. So there's some pretty significant challenges in you know, doing really efficient power management across sensors, figuring out which sensors actually deliver the most value, how to focus the attention of sensing, right, to be the things that are high value, just the way that you, know, you don't look at all parts of the room equally at all, at all different times and so on. Um, so energy efficiency is a critical part of this, and that applies that, at the lowest hardware level, but at every level of the architecture of the system. Um, the second thing that obviously is a big, big challenge here is you have to go from this very, very raw sensor data. And people who are less close to this sort of assume that you get clean, nice sensor data, you know exactly what's going on. Anyone who's ever built a system like this knows that you get crud out of here. You get all kinds of noise. The sensors are bad. If you want better sensors, you've got to pay a lot of money or a lot of power. All this kind of stuff. So you've got to move from that, obviously, to clean segmented data, which is most, where most people assume you're coming from. Once you have clean segmented data, you actually have to figure out high-level semantics, right? So this has been a grand challenge of a lot of computer science for a long time, and there's a lot of computing and data and knowledge uh, involved here. Um, and then what you'd really like to do, once you have these high-level semantics, boy, that's pretty high. I mean, from walk, leave, you know, uh, the room's clean or not, happy, angry, mad, you know, that kind of stuff matters a lot in your social interactions. Uh, is this situation dangerous? Is that person friendly to me? You'd like to know that kind of stuff. Not just in a military sense, like are they going to shoot at me, right? But you walk into a room, right? You, know, you get a sense of the room. Are you in a hostile environment? Do you have to win people? You know, you'd like to know all this kind of stuff. Or, you know, there's fairly tangible you know, kind of stuff like, you know, speech, speech recognition. He said, I don't like you, or something like that. And then you'd like to move from that with a model to actually proactive behavior, right? To suggest that you do something, to avoid something to help you, to coach you with the learning settings we were talking about. To suggest, oh, there's something interesting going on over there. Maybe you should move towards it, right? Or maybe, you know, you should focus the sensing apparatus you have, right? In, in the space, spend some power and try and figure out what's going on. So there's all kinds of high-level things. So that's, that's pretty hard. 
So just from the perspective of getting that done, that's hard. Um, and then you have to shoehorn this into a mobile computing kind of power on right? So an example of this is that we just built a prototype application that does real-time video event detection. Right? So this is a gesture recognition system against a noisy background. And we could probably make it better, but it's interesting to hold it up as an example. It requires about four teraflops to do in real time. So if you take a desktop power envelope and you scale that up, that's a you know, bunch of kilowatts. You're not going to carry a bunch of kilowatts in any wild dream of, of computing. So in the future, right, we like to get you know, this down to a watt, right, on a handheld. Is that crazy? No, it's not crazy. You know, we'll do the usual formula, right? So that's four orders of magnitude. So we'll expect two orders of magnitude from the algorithm people and two orders of magnitude from the systems people, right? I mean, that's been our historic formula of computer science for the last several decades. And it's not unreasonable that you could close that gap within five or eight years. It's not crazy. So that's the kind of challenge, right, that this is really about. Okay, so let me close with the following perspective. Um, Sometimes people talk about computing as if all the exciting stuff has already been done. Uh, and I don't believe that. I think actually we're just at the beginning of this really dramatic revolution in how computing is changing society. And we're fortunate to be in a field where we really do have global reach and that every aspect of society in all parts of the world, the implications of computing are unbelievable. So I like to frame this in terms that some of my biologist friends like to use, uh, which is uh, to think about phylogeny. So phylogeny is about the differentiation of species speciation that led to the tremendous diversity we have in the world today. And think about computing from the perspective of phylogeny. So in phylogeny, they talk about phylogeny trees, where you have branches for differentiation, which creates whole new classes of organisms uh, that occupy different niches in the ecosystem. So if you think about computing, right, we started out with gigantic systems like ENIAC, kind of room-sized computers, and that in a pretty straightforward fashion led to mainframes, right, those are the natural descendants. Uh, and then this really wonderful thing happened, and depending on when you want to characterize it, in the mid-70s or early 80s, where we produced for the first time personal computing systems. And this was a radical change, right? The radical change was all of a sudden went from a world in which we needed hundreds of these things to a world in which millions of computers were going to be out and about. That's pretty exciting. And we thought things were pretty good, and Intel really was happy about this, right? personal computing company. And then we discovered, well, you can network these things together. Right? Remember, PCs existed before they were networked in large scale. They were sort of closed computational devices that you carried data to. So we discovered you could network them, and then, wow, that came together with things like, you know, ARPANET and so on, email and, and things that really led us to all the power that's associated with network devices. That's pretty exciting. And that was a pretty dramatic change in the world that we lived with. And, of course, generated millions more opportunities, right, for computing devices. And that change was probably even smaller than the dramatic change around wireless. The change around wireless has been spectacular. Right? I mean, just looking around this room at how many you know, computing devices people have with them, right, laptops and, and so on, um, unimaginable in a tethered computing world, right? unimaginable. Um, and so each of these revolutions, each of these things have not eliminated. I mean, people still sell a lot of mainframe class systems. I don't mean the specific technology. I mean the modality of use, right? This is technology evolved. People still sell a lot of desktop PCs that are networked, right? There are pretty few that aren't networked anymore, but you know, there's this gigantic niche. Wireless computers haven't eliminated wired computers, right? They're an augment, right? Uh, and then, you know, the belief is, right, that we're on the cusp of a new explosion uh, of speciation around sensors and inference, where these computers actually go out uh, into the world and all of these customized devices as intuitive and aware computing systems. Uh, and the challenge I have for the community is to ask the question, will sensors and inference trigger a Cambrian explosion in diversity of computing devices? So if you go back to your you know, biological history, uh, people will tell you that the Cambrian explosion occurred many, many tens of millions of years ago. Um, and it was around a small set of genetic right, mutations, right? that allowed the uh, number of bioorganisms to proliferate by about four orders of magnitude. Right? So just a huge change, right? Um, that led us to the level of biodiversity that we had in the world up until about 2,000 years ago. <laughs> it's been going down for a while. But, uh, um, but uh, you know, that, that Cambrian explosion was an ex is an example of the kind of opportunity I think that we have before us. Um, so with that,
Um, let me close and just say a few words to wrap up here. And I've talked a little bit about Intel Research and the role we play in the company. We're the primary sort of a research community higher ed facing organization and company, and we believe deeply in this broad engagement with the research community. Uh, I talked about essential computing, and the, the key pillar of this uh, is this notion of trying to make computing valuable, trustworthy, relevant into these essential aspects of people's lives. Um, and the specific focus behind everyday sensing and perception, which is trying to drive sensing and inference into this practical uh, technological uh, uh, framework that actually allows us. <coughs> to deploy it widely and use it widely. So with that, I know we're over time a little bit. Apologize for that. I'd be happy to take a few questions. Yes? One thing I didn't hear from you is talk about the proper division of labor between people and computers. The proper division of labor? <laughs> it seems that you've got... Computers do all work. Right. <coughs> and the red flag went up when you talked about it. Computer to pacify your mother or your ten year old daughter. I know my mother would not be pacified if she knew that she was talking to the computer instead of me. <laughs> so, uh, so you're, you're asking if, if I would have a perspective on what would be the proper balance. Well, I don't know that that's our place to actually decide that. I mean, I think those are individual choices and those are societal choices for how you actually deploy the technology. You know, we tend to think about it as could you actually create the capability where that would be possible, right? The big, big, you know, example that people like to make jokes about um, is that, you know, could you actually translate between what your 15-year-old uh, uh, son or daughter says, right, and what it actually means, right, to some value system or some ethics framework that, that people of my age actually could understand. Uh, and so this notion of, you know, sort of semantic you know, relationship and in some sense deeper translation, I think could be deployed in many ways that would be valuable and, and really valuable right, in, in various family relationships and various community relationships and so on. Could it also be deployed in ways that are, you know, inherently evil or, or negative? Absolutely, right? There's no question about that. Um, so, so I think it's important to think about, you know, both the social aspects and the psychological aspects of this stuff at the same time as the technology. And that, I think, is reflected in, 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 in how we approach this stuff in our research with this multidisciplinary kind of uh, thing. There is no particular vision for how those technologies right, would be deployed in a personal setting or in a societal setting. I think that really, again, is, is largely the job of, of society to decide. It's not something that Intel should be. Yes. One thing when you're talking about this, I, I start thinking about one of the things that's not quite going right with the internet. So, for example, I like certain news about certain kinds of things as being useful in other things. What I end up paying for that thing is for my computer and my bandwidth. So I'm not actually funding the news, the quality of the news directly. I'm, I'm that gets funded some other ways, some of which I don't actually like, you know, pop-up ads or something like that. Things. And so a lot of what's happening is, is that where things are being funded is being, moving away from the core of what the value is yep. to these other things. I think that is a really bad, for example, when you walk into the store, you went to the thing that's matching your tastes and preferences and desires to be about you or about the seller. Yep. Okay, because the seller wants you to buy their stuff and doesn't care whether you actually enjoy it or not that much. So, so some of this is like how you have to sort of figure out how to get things aligned along the right dimensions, so that that I mean I I don't like the idea of of, of you know a big overlord telling you how this thing should be structured, but yet I think if things just sort of flow out, they tend to flow often towards these bad results, sort of like your previous answer. Well, you know I guess you could have different viewpoints on that. Um, it's not accidental. Right, that the internet services economy is organized around advertising, uh, that's because people launched internet services around information and, and consumers wouldn't pay for them. Right, so it's based on the collective response of, 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 of society and you know, the economic structure around that. Is that ideal for everyone? I don't know. I mean, maybe the New York, the New York Times or whatever your favorite information uh, vehicle is should, should sell you a pay-per-month service that's advertising free. They probably would if they could figure out how to build a business model for that. Um, it is absolutely true that trying to, to figure out what the, the, uh, the combination is between the technology, right, um, the economic structure, 
the social structure, right, and uh, and so on, the government structure that will actually build a sustainable, you know, dynamic um, uh, technology future that we all like is a big puzzle, right? And actually, we very much spend a lot of time thinking about that at Intel because we have this, uh, we have a very broad view of, of thinking about the um, ecosystem. And, you know, if we are going to create innovation or drive innovation in the marketplace, who do we have to bring along as, as allies, right? How do we actually have to develop the marketplace and so on? Um, so we do think about many of these things, but, but frankly, you know, we have a limited oracle to understand what the future is going to be like, and, and the world is a pretty surprising place. You know, uh, uh, it uh, it evolves in ways that I think many of us don't, don't expect it to. Right? So, um, I think those are great challenges, but um, I don't know that any single entity has any great control right, over how those things come out. Uh, you mentioned uh, parallel computing and parallel programming a couple of times. Uh, yeah, I could have talked two or three hours on that. So yeah. I wanted to give a broader talk here. I, I just wanted to uh, get the, the viewpoint from, from Intel, which is uh, we, fairly recently, we went through this parallel computing boom, right, at the end of the 80s and early yes. 90s. And yes. I, I would argue that that effort was largely a failure. Why does Intel and all the other computer makers think that this time around is going to be different? Good question. Good question. Uh, I was a part of that huge national investment called the High Performance Computing and Communications Initiative, as were perhaps some of the other people in this room that may or may not wish to identify. But, but I think actually what happened is interesting. Um, so it's not the case that I, I wouldn't characterize it quite the same way, way, way that you did. I think what happened is that when the government, which was the primary funder of these activities, thinks about parallelism, it thinks about its high-end computing needs. So parallelism is equated with HPC. Um, and the government <coughs> operates in a space where um, it wants to be able to build leading-edge capability, petaflop systems, petaflop systems, back then it was teraflop systems, right? Um, and is willing to do almost anything to get there, right? So, you know, I mean, Intel built one of the first teraflop systems called ASCII, right? It was a message passing based system. It required, you know, PhDs in physics and, and other disciplines to program. Uh, and those folks are brilliant, and you can allot 50 PhDs, right, to tune a particular code to run on that system, right? Um, so so the, the problems with that was that the, the economics don't match the mainstream computer business. You know, you have a uh, ability to put spectacularly smart people on it in very, very, you know, large quantity. Uh, to build very small amounts of functionality, right, from the software industry point of view, um, but a tremendous amount of you know, hard physics and computational problems. Um, and the emphasis is on big systems, right? Um, we're in a different space. The different space is we're interested in small systems because the majority of computer systems that we sell fit in something this big, right, or maybe something this big, right, or even smaller. So, um, so first, we're not interested in big. Um, second, the economics of the uh, software industry, consumer software industry, are dramatically different. Um, in general, you don't get to hire, you know, brilliant PhDs in physics in large numbers to program your applications. I don't mean that the people that are building those applications aren't smart. They are smart, right? But there's a different level of, of focus and sophistication. Second, there's huge pressure to deliver with low cost, um, large amounts of functionality, all of the kinds of things that drive complexity in the software industry. So you can't use the solutions that worked in the, in, in the high-end space. Now, all of that is by the way of driving up the contracts. Now the question is, why would we expect that things would be better this time? Because we did uncover that there's some really, really hard problems to this kind of extreme problems. Well, the first is, if you're not driven by high-end capability, you don't have to bite off the extreme physical the parallelism scaling that you're always fighting at the HPC end in the near term. You know, today, uh, you know, quad-core platforms are, are pervasive. Um, you know, six and eight core systems are coming down the pipe in the next six to nine months. Um, so you can draw a nice extrapolation with Moore's Law for what the core counts are going to look like. So uh, in the near term, you know, the kinds of techniques we're using around, um, you know, parallelization tools, uh, threading tools, uh, race analysis tools, I think, are, are really you know, pretty effective, right, in bringing many of the applications along that path. Um, I think the big challenge is, uh, uh, in the longer run, right, how do we actually minimize the incremental software development effort as you move from 
you know, 64 core system to 120 core system to a 256 core system. So when I asked, when I when I, when I framed the, the challenge for the UPCRC program, and we go and talk to those guys, we say, look, don't don't tell us about things that apply that involve effort that scales with the number of cores. Not interesting, right? Don't tell us about stuff that's down in the 816 core range. Get up here in the large numbers where you have an opportunity in the research community to affect the future. Because you guys work on stuff that maybe it takes three years to do the research, maybe it takes three years to transition that into what might, what might be a product someday. That's the most optimistic you know, sort of timeline. So you better be shooting out at seven, ten years out, which means you're in this large core count kind of space. Um, there are some good reasons why uh, we're more optimistic about success. Um, first, um, one of the reasons that makes parallel programming so hard on HPC systems is the real lack of significant bandwidth amongst the different parts of the system. It's just killer, right? And it's all about packaging boundaries and scale of the system. On chip, right, we have huge amounts of wiring, right? Large numbers of layers of metallization. We can put down a huge amount of communication power. So bandwidth is, is, is good. Um, second, we have uh, large, uh, we have a much greater capability to engineer latency. And the system latencies are much, much lower. And we know that if you reduce system latencies and you pump up bandwidth, you can be sloppy in all kinds of ways. You don't have to eke out every last bit of performance. That, that's the negative way of saying it. The, the positive way of saying it is many problems go away. Right? You can solve them with runtime techniques, you can solve them with caching, you can solve them with other kinds of things. So that's a reason for optimism. Um, a third thing I would say is that um, the metric for success is different. So the metric for success in the HPC world is uniform linear scaling, right? That's what people have always wanted. You know, they don't always get it. In fact, they rarely get it. But that's the metric of success, right? You know, frankly, um, in terms of what the fundamental economic proposition for Intel is, is that we build a new version of a chip. It's more valuable to the customers. They want to buy it, and they want to buy it soon, right? the fundamental value proposition. They don't worry so much about parallelism. We're computer scientists. We worry about parallelism, right? But the end users don't worry much about parallelism. They just worry about really getting value. And so the same way they were buying gigahertz, I mean, the gigahertz didn't relate to performance in a linear fashion. Uh, you know, they need to be in the mode of buying parallelism, right? Where parallelism doesn't have to have a linear relationship to performance, right? But it has to have an incremental increased value. So that could be, you know, that you can run you know, HD video on your laptop, but you couldn't run HD video very well before. It could be that, you know, it server charges, you know, some aspect of the security properties of your of your application. It could be that it produces a sublinear, or maybe super linear, you know, that's possible, performance improvement in some application that you care about, like Photoshop or or you know your favorite video game or what have you. So it is it is uh, it is true we looked at parallelism before. Um, I think the context is significantly different. And I think the bar for success is, is significantly different. Right? So I think that if we can achieve performance improvements right, without requiring deep rewriting of all software that exists, and we continue to see those performance improvements, plus the other thing that we can get, that you'll continue to see people saying, I want to buy you know, new computers with more parallelism in them. And then that will become a, a self-reinforcing sustaining kind of capability, because then the software vendors will actually have a competitive motivation Right, to make their software deeply parallels and ready and forward scalable. I like these to come forward scalable for, for software systems that move forward from generation to generation of parallelism without a requirement of either source code change or ideally even binary code change um, as the, the gold standard or the grand challenge actually for the software industry going forward. Sorry for a very long minute answer, that's a very important topic for us. Maybe you can take one more. Margaret. Thanks for coming up. <laughs> so that was one view of parallels, which is sort of the on-chip one. But yes. the sensing and perception side of things also has parallels, but it's distributed geographically. So do you see any overlap between how you write software for that world and this parallelism problem on chip? Um, it's possible. It's possible. Um, so you could take the view that you want to build software in this very <coughs> flexible you know, uh, architecture that allows you to couple it and then put it back together and so on. Um, and that'll happen, right? no question. I think that's the easy case, right? Because if you can actually build it for this distributed environment, putting it together, boy, in some sense, that's the easy part, right? Um, so it's all about which applications and where the spectrum you want. And I think that it's right to point out that um, a lot of the use of parallelism and additional capability on chips 
will be, right, multi-programming will be multiple different things, right, coming together and making use of all that capability on the chip at the same time. Um, I think it's just, you know, we tend to, to look at, okay, here's the things that will happen easily, here's the things that, you know, will happen with a little bit of effort, maybe some heavy lifting by some players in the industry. Um, in research, we tend to think about what are the really hard things, right, that are not going to happen in, 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 in just a straightforward fashion that we need to actually focus energy on so that the whole breadth of things goes forward. So I think that's a very, very important thing to point out, that there are many things that will make use of these multi-core chips without you know, sort of very heavy lifting. Um, and there's a tremendous utility for the increased capability and performance that they, they represent. 